I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to my podcast number 466, Stage 1 Exploratory Play from our new podcast series, Stages of Play for Toddlers and Preschoolers with Language Delays, brought to you by my website, Teach Me to Talk, where we're the largest provider of ASHA-approved continuing education uh, credits for early interventionists and speech language pathologists. Thank you so much for being here, and I want to explain what you're watching or listening to in case this is the first time that you're joining me. Each of my podcasts is a continuing education course for therapists, and the standard length for a course is about an hour. So that's how long this course will be today. I'm so happy that we can share our videos and our courses here on YouTube so that professionals can participate and parents as well. And one more thing, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that now. We so appreciate your support. In this course today, we are looking at stage one, which is the first stage in our Stages of Play podcast series. And the focus today is for exploratory play. Before we get too uh, far into our content, though, let me remind you that you can purchase the CE credit for this course uh, for $5 if you're a therapist. And if you're a parent, you can also purchase the handout for this course, which will walk you through all of the information that we're talking about today. Now, for this series, I'm using the same kind of format that I do for a couple of my therapy manuals, and we're calling this how to play and what to say. And so I know that you are going to want to get the handout for the show because it'll have all the tips and strategies that we'll be talking about throughout the course. Also, purchasing the handout is a great way that you can support our work. And so many extended caregivers, grandparents, teachers, nannies, other kinds of people who are connected to a child who is having some difficulty learning to communicate uh, email and ask how they can support our work. And so purchasing the handouts to send those to a child's parents or use them with the team or just use them during your uh, your time with the child yourself. So again, you can buy the handout for $5 or any other amount that you would like to give because you can customize uh, that donation. Now let's talk for a little bit about the course layout for this course and every course in this series. So we are going to be taking a very systematic look at each of the stages of play. So We'll start with the developmental age, and we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. And then we'll be looking at the play skills, the language skills, the activities and strategies to help facilitate each of those play skills and language skills. And then lastly, we're also going to take a look at recommended toys. And so I want to make this series super hands-on. So there's a toy list for each of the stages of play that we'll release in conjunction uh, with when the course is released for this stage. And during each of the courses, I'll demo some of the toys that are uh, listed there in that recommended toy uh, section and we'll go through a few sample play routines and some sample scripts to match the play and the language strategies for each toy. Now again we're going to call that how to play and what to say and that's right there on the handout so be sure to look for that. I know that's going to be the very best part. I'm so excited about it so let's get going. So today we're looking at stage one exploratory play. Now again all this information is on the handout so if you purchase that already please follow along. So stage one is what? It's obviously where all all babies begin and so the chronological age for this is birth to eight months now that's chronological age and again we look at that for children who are following a typical or an expected path of development however this information would also apply to every older child an older baby an older toddler or even a preschooler who is still functioning within uh, this stage or this range of skills and so we know that older babies and toddlers with language delays and again even preschoolers with significant developmental delays may also still be in this first stage of play and so why is this important this is important so that we can meet a child where he or she currently is that's what we have to be, uh, think about when we're picking a place to begin we always begin with what a child can already do before we are uh, ready to move on so you can't start at whatever your long-term goal is and if you've listened to any of my courses 
courses in the past, I talk about this all the time. There's usually too much ground to cover when a child is functioning here developmentally, but we want him to be way up here, and that's so unrealistic. And that's what causes us to maybe stall out in therapy or just never really even get any traction or any progress from the beginning because we're starting at a point that's too high. So here's an analogy that I like to talk about. It would be like uh, saying to a parent, an adult, someone who can maybe run around the block and then we would say, hey, by next week, we're going to have you running a marathon or by next month, we're going to have you running a marathon. That is completely unrealistic to go from just running a, a few hundred feet, not even half a mile versus that. 26 mile marathon so we have to begin at the beginning with where a child is right now and that's today so even if a child is much much older coming back and really looking at where they are and thinking how can I bump this child up to the next stage which is what we're going to talk about toward the end of the show today that's where we always want to begin we start with where a child is currently functioning so for stage one let's take a look at the specific skills that we expect to see or that we should be facilitating in this stage and again these are listed on your handouts and so the big thing that we're talking about here in stage one is that babies are learning to move their bodies and explore their environments with all their senses so that's what we're going to be talking about so again that's why we call this exploratory play so a big kind of summary statement here would be that sensory exploration and early motor movements with very basic toys and basic objects uh, just the manipulation and learning what to do with those and how their hands work really dominate this developmental period so let's walk through each of these big areas remember we said we're going to be looking at play skills language skills activities and strategies and then recommended toys. So let's walk through um, these big areas and we'll talk about how we organize each stage and sort of how we think about uh, this, the individual skills and how they're all connected. And so here uh, we go with our analysis of everything that's going on during stage one. So let's take a look at stage one play skills. Here a child learns how his own body works and learns to gain control of his body. And how does he do that? He moves around, he kicks, he he reaches, he rolls, and he scoots. And again, these are motor movements. They're not necessarily play skills, but they are an important prerequisite because children who can't move their bodies, if they have physical limitations, that's certainly going to affect how they interact with and begin to manipulate and use toys. So we always want to keep that in mind. And here, remember, we said how children gain information and how they learn about their world here in this stage is that they look at, they reach for, they grasp, and they mouth all items uh, to learn more about again how what that item is and how 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 it pertains to his or her immediate environment now at the end of this stage uh, a child again matures and grows throughout this and a child begins to participate in games like peekaboo and patty cake and perform even a few just the simplest little hand motions like covering their eyes or clapping during those games. So there are really exciting things that happen toward the end of this. And I'll, I'll tell you too, the kids who can't do that yet, you know that they are not quite at that eight month developmental level yet. And that's another way that we can sort of use this information diagnostically as therapists as we're really looking at where is this child truly, truly functioning? And we want to always talk about here uh, with all of our stages of play, and I mentioned this back in the introductory show, number 465, how we, how we think about play too as far as social relationships. And so here at stage one, we characterize this stage of play as unoccupied, meaning that it's unstructured without any sort of real agenda. An agenda may not make sense to you unless you've really thought about all the stages of play. And remember when we did this in the interview, introductory show we reviewed all the way up to about four or five and so certainly children who are playing when they are developmentally four or five have lots of agendas they know what they want to do they've already decided oh today we're going to play pirates and I'm playing with you know two or three of my friends and this is what Tom's going to do and this is what Logan's going to do and this is what Cindy's going to do you know they already have in their minds again that agenda well here back at stage one we don't have that and we can't even really as the adult always 
set the agenda even like we can when we help other uh, children when they're in these older developmental ranges because again they're just not developmentally there yet but this stage is so important and even though a child's play with toys might appear scattered or again unstructured it lays the groundwork for everything that's going to come and for really learning how to use toys and manipulate toys and then learning about the world so those are a child's play skills and again it might seem a little um, basic at this point but this is where all babies start and if we're thinking about again matching the developmental age to a child regardless of what their chronological age is you know this is where we begin with play Next, we're looking at the language skills for stage one. So again, follow along on your handout if you have that. What are the main things that we want to see occurring in the child's acquisition of communication skills here, even at this earliest developmental level from birth to eight months? So first of all, we want them to interact and connect with others. And how would we gauge that? That would be by how, um, how much eye contact they're making. Are they able to maintain eye contact? Are they able to track us as we move throughout their space? How do they respond to us when we talk Talk to them are they smiling are we seeing those positive warm nurturing of, well our nurturing but their responses to our nurturing are they aware of that are they again beginning that those first stages of reciprocity another language skill here is that children quiet at the at the sound of a familiar voice and they show awareness of a speaker and so we certainly want to see those things happening the third language skill, they learn to respond with smiles, movement, and early vocalizations like coos, laughs, squeals, whines, and babbling. And so if you'll remember, uh, children in this developmental age are not using words yet. They're not understanding or they're beginning by the end of the stage to start to link meaning with words. And so again, when we're looking at this, we have to think about, you know, what, what comes before words? What are the kinds of vocalizations and particularly responsive vocalizations? that we would uh, notice in a child or that we would see and hear him do. And again, those things like early babbling, uh, laughing, shrieking, all of those early things that let us know that a child has a voice. He or she can activate his or her voice. And they know, they know that they can, again, use that responsively to you and interactively. Uh, the next skill is that children, even in this earliest developmental stage, learn to convey their needs and emotional states. Sometimes though, especially if, the, if children are not at, toward the end end of this stage and moving to stage two, those things aren't even necessarily purposeful yet. But what do parents do? We learn to interpret their uh, every little vocalization or, or their facial expressions and we get really, really good at decoding the messages that they're sending to us. And those are all very important things that we want children, again, toward the end of the stage to be able to uh, demonstrate some intentionality and demonstrate some purposefulness as they are beginning to learn how to use their little bodies and their little voices and their faces to communicate with you. The next language skill is sharing attention between people and objects and we, we as therapists call this joint attention and this means that a child is able to shift his or her attention between an object that you are both paying attention to and you both realize that you're both talking about the same thing even if the parent is the one doing all the talking but a child is able to shift his or her attention between the object and you, looking back at you as you are maybe above them and looking down with them as they play. And they are able to do that. You know, look at whatever it is that they're playing with and then look back at you as you're talking to them and as you are giving them information and then look back at that object. And that is a huge developmental milestone that we want to see all children develop. And it really does start here in this earliest stage. The next one is develops a longer attention span. So again, this is another really important prelinguist skill that we see happen with play and as children learn how to do more things with the objects and remember here at stage one what do we say they're primarily looking at it grasping it just beginning to hold it just beginning to maybe turn it a little bit those just earliest fine motor uh, skills that they would demonstrate with a toy and so again when they're doing that over time they learn how to stick with that a little bit longer and we need children to learn how to stay with an activity so that they're not bouncing all over the place just going from object A to object B on to object C you know again within the sec within about a you know five second ten second uh, span they're not really settled enough and, and in that just right place for learning when their sensory systems are still so overwhelmed like that and they're just constantly seeking information. So one of the important things that we want children to do here at stage one is to really 
began to develop the ability to pay attention and the ability to stay with one toy for a long period of time. Another thing that they do here is take turns with others. And then again, this is just the most basic elementary turn taking. They're not really doing anything with the toys yet, but they are listening to you. That might be a child's first turn here. They are, again, maybe even responding with a coo or a babble or a, it can just be a look. You know, they've, they've been down here focused and then you start to talk to them and they look up at you. That's their response. And that's the very beginning of turn taking. So we certainly want to see that develop here. And that's a language skill. You know, I haven't said this yet, but well, a lot of these things are pre-linguistic skills. And what does that mean? Before language, before words. So these are the things that have to take place first. And uh, let's, let's just talk about, well, let's get through these two other skills and then we'll kind of circle back around to what I want to say here. The next language skill is to get attention. And again, this is toward kind of that six month and beyond. They begin to cry, coo, laugh, squeal, vocalize, do anything that would again bring your attention to them. And remember what we said at the beginning, this is not as intentional or as purposeful as it should be by the end of this phase and certainly moving on into stage two. And then we said by the end of this period, children will begin to recognize their own names. And remember this goes up to about eight months and typically developing babies certainly are looking when their parents call their names or when someone else calls their name by the end of this period and we certainly want to see that firmly established in stage two we want to see this by 12 months it is a real area of concern if children are not responding to their names by 12 months so I want you to remember that all right so let's talk about language skills really quickly and this is particularly important um, may or relevant for those of you who follow my work and who have some other therapy manuals and you may be saying okay stages of play how does this fit into these other stages that you've taught us and that that we talk about all the time and so remember what we said with pre-linguistic skills and if if you've never seen my 11 skills uh, chart with the 11 pre-linguistic skills that all toddlers master before words emerge uh, that's from my therapy manual let's talk about talking and we've just run through several of the skills that we as speech language pathologists and other professionals who um, who work with children who are having difficulty acquiring early communication skills these are the skills that we look for again and that have to be in place before kids start to talk and so we just named a lot of those response to events in the environment that's what we want children doing when they are responding to the toys when we're look they're looking at the toys they're holding the toys they're they're again be just beginning to manipulate them and understand this is an object separate from me but I can act on it I can I can make it do some different things and again we'll get into cause and effect and those things on into the next stage but in this earliest stage we want that foundation established with I can respond to events in my environment the next one is response to other people and we have talked about this and by the end of this stage we want kids doing very simple basic actions that accompany just those really familiar social games like patty cake and like peekaboo and some other ones that we'll talk about and so again that's stage two or a skill number two pre-linguistic uh, skill number two and we talked about turn taking and we talked about a longer attention span and we talked about joint attention and those are all skills that are again down there in that number one two three four and five if you're looking at those pre-linguistic skills so if you were thinking how does this fit into some of your other manuals or some of your other uh, courses or, or treatment uh, approaches that we've talked about this certainly is is fits so nicely with that. So stage one, really, children are learning so many of those foundational skills here in stage one of play. If you're looking at building verbal imitation skills in toddlers, and we talk about imitating words doesn't start with you say mama, the child says mama. It starts way before that, and it really starts with learning how to imitate actions with objects. We are not even there yet. That happens in stage two here with the stages of play, but here in this earliest stage, we are still again introducing children to toys and exposing them to toys and helping them learn again how their little bodies work and that they can can control their environments and can certainly control uh, and manipulate these earliest little toys and objects that will give them the opportunity but because we're talking about imitation with building verbal imitation skills we're not there yet again we're going to get there but this is where we begin with that so that's a good look at, at uh, language skills and then we looked at play skills. Next let's move, move on and talk about activities and strategies. 
Now we're gonna talk about the activities and strategies that we recommend for children who are in this first stage of play. So what are these? First of all, children in this stage learn language by listening to a caregiver, and that would be whether you are singing, talking, reading, and certainly when you're playing little games with them. The second activity or strategy that we want to recommend, and again, let me say, this is, this is for you therapists that you're wanting you know, to know what are the strategies that I'm going to list in my IFSP or my IEP. Or, these are the things that you would actually list, and these are the things that you would talk to parents about. All right, one thing that I say all the time, particularly here at stage one, is that we have to really teach parents how to enjoy their time with the child so that it doesn't look excruciatingly painful when they are sitting and trying to play with their child. And again, uh, I'm not really exaggerating when I say that sometimes we have to really work with parents to really establish that. And a little line that, and, and sometimes parents get so uncomfortable when they're in therapy, especially at the beginning, and especially if the child has a significant issue and they're, again, they, they're there for your help, but they don't always know how therapy is going to go or how to proceed. And so you just really want to spend a lot of time talking about that and a lot of time talking about just just really learning to interact and enjoy that and be joyful uh, when you're playing together. And one thing that I always like to say is here at this stage, we have to really focus on lavishing love. And that's so important because children here in these earliest stages of development, they're not really linking meaning with words yet. So there's not a lot of behavioral redirection that you can do just yet. We have to do a lot of environmental modification, but even while we're doing that, we wanna be sure that our uh, our approach again is loving and that that again establishes those relationships that we want to get going right at the beginning okay I've already talked about this about a child's receptive language and this is so important to talk to parents about especially if they don't have a background in a childhood education or child development haven't done a lot of reading didn't really prep a lot for this baby that they now have and so sometimes again their expectations of where language development should be are sometimes unrealistic and so we have to really talk to parents in this phase phase and I'm and I'm not saying that parents don't instinctively know these things they certainly do but again some of us when they're we just we just have a gap when we're especially in a blind spot when we're talking about our own children and so uh, we have to really help parents through that and so as far as receptive language goes and remember what is receptive language mean it means what children understand so here at that this earliest stage you remember we're talking about birth to eight months kids usually don't understand words yet but it's so important that they hear you talk so that they can begin to link meaning with words and again by the end of this phase and as they move on through stage two of play we know that those uh, they will begin to understand language and they will begin to follow directions and they will begin to understand uh, again what particular words mean so so what do we do? We talk about what a child is paying attention to. And so here in this stage of play, one of the best things that we can help a parent do is not talk about things that are going to happen tomorrow or even this afternoon or whatever, or something that happened yesterday. We talk about the here and now. So whatever a baby is looking at or paying attention to is what we should be talking about. And so, uh, and it's not just talk, 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 talk. There are other things that we can do to really make our language more effective and help children really learn how to listen and stay connected with us and so we can use things beyond talking in paragraphs and and full sentences we also need to use lots of sound effects and why would we do that because that really captures the child's attention and again it's alerting his little auditory system oh that's a different word where did that come from or oh I like the sound of that that word you know that's that's not something I hear my mom say all the time and so certainly that can be really helpful single words and single words are so important because we know that the vocabularies of late talkers new talkers late talkers every talk talker at the beginning starts out with what? Starts out with single words. And so instead of trying to always speak in full, complete adult modeled sentences, we have to really break it down and be really, really basic. And again, shorter phrases. And when we're using short, shorter phrases or even longer sentences, we know that we can do some things with word placement that will actually help a child learn that word more quickly. If we can put at the keyword at the ends of our phrases and at the ends of our sentences, that really I think about it as like leaving that last impression. That's the last thing that a child heard. And so again, his little brain begins to organize that and really register that and link meaning with the word that he's hearing with the object that you are showing him or that he or she 
are looking at. Uh, the next activity or strategy is one that we want to want to continue talking about throughout this show and this whole entire series and its key words. And so we want to be sure that we are thinking about vocabulary development and that we are purposeful and intentional when we're choosing the words that we target. And we want to use science-backed strategies and science to really, and what research tells us works when we are choosing target words. And we'll talk more about that as we uh, look at the toys and move further along. But the but the, the term keyword is what I want you to get there because we're going to be talking about that through the rest of this series. Um, keywords are so important not only as we play with the recommended toys that we're going to talk about, but they're so important during everyday routines too. And so as parents perform caregiving routines like changing diapers, bathing, uh, feeding our children, those are the kinds of uh, activities that are so important for language learning too and again it's it's the repetition with the keywords and it's the and i've already said this a couple of times but it's how purposeful you are in teaching your child and in really as a therapist helping a parent learn that that's how children learn language uh, another activity or strategy that again this is more of a common sense one that we as therapists know and that we do but we're not always as deliberate about sharing with parents, but we want to really help uh, parents learn to use gestures to help children understand words and link meaning with words here in this developmental period. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to point to toys that they're talking about, or they're really uh, tapping on the toy and helping a child direct his little eyes and his visual attention to that. So again, that they are listening to your words and then linking that meaning with the visual picture that they're seeing. So we want to be sure that we're providing cues, and we'll talk a little bit more about effective cues in a minute. And the last very valuable activity and strategy that's so uh, related to the skill uh, that we want to develop here with calling your child's name and helping him learn to respond to his name. And so sometimes we talk to parents about this and then parents start to realize, I don't really call her by her name very much. I call her sugar boo or I call her baby girl or I call her whatever. And so then sometimes, again, typically developing children really don't have difficulty learning to respond and learning what their names are. And even at the four and six month level, they're really alerting to their names and really starting to turn when they hear a word that sounds like their name, even at about six months. And so we certainly, by the end of this period, period want children uh, doing that and sometimes parents think gosh you know I haven't really worked on that very much and and, and again I want to I just want to say children have to learn children have to hear their names to be able to understand that that's their own name right and so that's certainly something that we want to talk to parents about and that's here at this stage with stage one of play in language development that that's one skill that we really want uh, parents focused on so that was it for activities and strategies now let's move on and talk about recommended toys so with toys here in stage one we have to remember that children are experiencing the world through their senses so we have to give them so many different opportunities and like I said before, exposure is uh, the, the kind of overall key concept here. And it's so that children have time to practice with the toys and have common objects, just so that they can learn how different items in their world how they look so they can use their their senses to see how they sound so they can hear them how they taste when they explore with their mouths because we know that mouthing is a predominant way that children learn about objects in their environment here at this earliest stage of development and certainly how objects feel when they hold them in their little hands but children really it's not just about their hands here with fine motor skill development for uh, play skill development they real really are taking in everything so we have to look at toys that really stimulate their senses and so i've got a nice uh, list here at the bottom of page one of your handout so toys that they can see and so let me just go through these and again this is just kind of our general look in a minute we're going to look at real specific recommended toys but right now we're just in the overview phase so we need to give children uh, in this stage one different opportunities for uh, visual stimulation so uh, the best one here is an unbreakable mirror and certainly children at this phase tummy time is so important even if a child is older if he or she is not mobile and still in this stage i'm sure that's something that you are uh, continuing to do even if they're older and past this eight month 
up, age range, any kinds of mobiles, anything that's visually interesting for a child, particularly if they are not moving yet. We want to be able to give them, uh, bring different uh, opportunities for them to process visual information to them. Pictures of faces, and again, that's usually in books. At the beginning of this, and we think about this with typically developing babies, we know that visually they only see in black and white until they're older, and again, that four to six month level there. And so brightly colored uh, pictures are going after that stage is kind of when we start that. And if we're thinking about older babies and toddlers and preschoolers with language delays, their vision, you know, again, they're, they're past that chronological age. But we still, again, kind of want to think about that with the high contrast. And lots of our little guys end up uh, having some visual problems. They uh, sometimes with our global developmental delays, you know, visual issues, children need glasses or some other kind of, certainly our accommodations to help them be able to um, see better. Uh, anything like touch and feel books, because again, why is that important? They're using two senses together. They're, they're uh, merging their visual senses with their little hands they feel the objects too. Soft dolls, stuffed animals, and uh, toys with lights. We're not going to, as I said, talk about too many electronic toys here because sometimes that can really limit a child's ability to participate. We'll talk about the reasons why in a few minutes. Uh, but but though, let's just say those were the, that's our list there for objects that we would think about uh, helping a child see or use his visual uh, sense. The next one is hearing, so it's auditory sense. So what does that mean? We need to provide toys that make noise. So that, and not necessarily electronics. I'm talking about toys that crinkle, that squeak, that rattle, that ring. Music toys are always great, but even things like a rain stick, we're going to talk about that, or certainly even mom and dad's recorded voices on really simple, uh, low-tech AAC options to use if we're doing that. Uh, the next one is taste. So what are some things beyond diet? that we can do to help children again. And remember we said that mouthing is a predominant way that children experience toys here in this phase. So teething toys or any object that's safe to mouth and chew. And so we do have to worry about choking risk here. And so you always want to be sure that you are evaluating the safety uh, of any choice that you present. And that's, you know, important not only as a mom, but certainly as a therapist. And then lastly, feel their tactile sense. So anything like texture blankets, taggy toys, touch and feel books, Books, rattles, bendy balls, links, squeezable toys, uh, and then soft dolls and stuffed animals, and even even toys that vibrate. So those are kind. Of, that's kind of the overall view. Remember what we said. Why are we doing this? Because this is the exploratory phase, and this is uh, where children again are really beginning to integrate all of the information that they're processing, things that they see, things that they hear. How does that feel? Uh, and, and again, that's certainly uh, the beginning point of play for every child that we're going to work with. So those were the big ideas or main areas that we are looking for and trying to facilitate in stage one. So next we're going to move on and talk about how to execute and how to implement therapy at this stage is we use play to develop language or sometimes it's vice versa where we use language to develop play skills. So let's move on and take a look at that now. So we're talking about implementation and remember I told you that I was going to call this how to play and what to say and so this is on the second page of your handout for this course. So this is basically what we should be doing when we are helping parents, um, when we're first beginning to work with families with children who are in the stage. So I have broken this down into four basic kinds of activities that we're going to use with children who are in this stage. So first of all, uh, we're going to sing to them. So we'll talk about that. We're going to play social games with them. We're going to read with them and then play with toys. And again, playing with toys is the main focus for uh, this podcast series, but we have to do some other things that really get kids ready for that. And so that's what we're gonna talk about here. And so let's first talk about singing and how important music is for language development. And we know that singing certainly attracts a child's attention and keeps him interested in what you were doing, even if he doesn't understand all the words. Most toddlers love music and love singing, and it's one of the easiest things that we can do uh, to again work on language even even without the talking piece and we certainly want to make parents understand this even throughout a child's everyday activities now we can and I, let me say this lots of times with children who again are difficult to um, 
they have some difficulty learning how to interact with other people and they're really kind of doing their own thing or sticking to their own agenda. Singing sometimes really is one of the first ways that we see them be able to connect with someone. And I've had parents tell me, over and over and over you know i just learned that music was my primary way of getting him interested in what i wanted him to do so they'll say that i developed a song for everything so that we had a song for eating breakfast and we had a song for taking a bath and we had a song for getting in the car and we had a song for you know getting dressed just all the things that you would do throughout the day and so many parents have told me that that's a one strategy that really really worked for them so when we start to first work with families particularly with families who have children with pretty significant delays if that's something that they're not doing and you recognize that that child really likes music and every time you sing to him that's certainly a very practical and functional strategy that you can get going with very little effort other than you just talking to your parent about hey do you see how he lights up when I sing to him you know watch him watch what's about to happen here have you noticed this with me and so really again walk a parent through that and then help a parent come up with some different songs that they can sing for example they might sing you are my sunshine every morning when their child wakes up and again are we really teaching them to link meaning with you know sunshine and that no we're helping children learn how to listen and learn how to interact and learn how to respond uh, it might be that they're singing twinkle twinkle little star you know that might be one of their nighttime songs that they sing and so again help parents really come up uh, with some of those songs I've listed some familiar songs here on the handout so you can take a look at that if you need help with that and the therapy resource that I recommend for that is my therapy manual uh, teach me to play with you and I'll be sure to link that below here uh, in our description on YouTube and so the, learning those kinds of songs and teaching a parent the hand motions for those and again by the end of this period we want a child doing that with us and so we have to get those routines going and get that established <coughs> pardon me so that a child again learns how to be with us and singing is a great way to do that the next thing that we want to do is teach a child and a parent to learn to play social games now I talk about social games all the time uh, and certainly if you have read any of my therapy manuals you know that that's kind of the starting point that I use for everybody every child with any kind of speech language delay so let's talk about what social games are and why they're important so social games are routines that we use to teach a baby to interact with you and again this is not just a therapy thing parents have been playing social games with children probably forever <laughs> and so we're talking about things that I've mentioned previously games like peekaboo where you cover your face with a blanket or with your hands and you say you know uh, you know uh, where's Lucy where's Lucy where's Lucy <gasps> boo and so again, over time, we want a child to begin to respond to us with that game, to smile, to act excited when their head is covered or when, you know, eventually when they're learning to put their little hands over their own face, you know, certainly you're going to do that at the beginning. But any of those little games, and again, this, like we said before, um, th these teach children to learn to interact with you and to stay with you and to want to listen to your words and link meaning with that and then the other main skill is over time it teaches the child to begin to imitate your actions and remember what we said about when a child learns how to imitate words you can't just start with the words they start with earlier easier skills and so remember we said that we can't teach imitation yet with toys because the kid isn't there yet but we certainly again can begin by the end of this period to teach a child how to imitate some really simple actions and some body actions uh, and so again to get this going uh, as therapists we just have to teach parents these little games and convince them to play and so I just usually and to get these going in therapy I say to parents you know teaching social games is one of the things that I do at the beginning because over time a child is going to learn how to do his part meaning that he's going to copy what I do and imitate me and all kids have to start there they're not going to have a kid learn how to imitate words until he can imitate actions and until he can imitate a body body movements and so that's how we can start to talk about that and so and I just teach the little play routines and the social games again they're listed here on your handout if you want to get that and if you need real specific instructions step-by-step -step instructions teach me to play with you is a great uh, therapy resource for you to do that uh, I'll link that below like I said but I'm also going to link a podcast um, 
called Social Games, and I think it's number 402. I'm pretty sure it is, but where we walk through a lot of different social games. But here for for this, you know, let, let's just say that we want to get these little games going. And so a great way to do this, like we talked about with songs, is to really teach parents really specific social games that they can pair with everyday routines. And so one of my favorites is, um, you know, we talked about peekaboo, and you can certainly do that when they are changing their child or, you know, in, you can play it all day long in the bathtub, you can play it in the car seat, you know, in the van when you're going to pick up your older children, you can play it in the grocery store cart anywhere anytime but when you start get really specific with parents about hey you sh you know when do when do you think you could play this game and make this a part of your routine and the reason this is good for children is because of the repetition and that's how all kids learn everything but for parents it's just a reminder to play the game because so many times parents will say oh, I forgot all about that or I didn't even play that with them this week oh my goodness I can't believe I didn't do that and so if we can link the games with their everyday routines it's going to be a lot more uh, they'll be a lot more successful with it. Uh, so things like uh, this little piggy when you change a child's diaper or peekaboo when you're drying them off at bath time or when they're, wa they're waiting on their meal, they're sitting in their high chair and you know you've got to wait for that food to cool before you give it to them. You know maybe that's a time that you can always play patty cake or something and again why are you doing that? You're teaching them to interact with you. So that's a social piece of language development. And over time, remember what we said, our main thing is we begin to teach them to understand what words mean as they, as they remember the little songs and then understand, you know, when mommy says this, we always clap. You know, that's how they get there. And then imitation. That, that's another big skill that we teach with social games. Our next thing that we want to talk about here is reading. Now, reading is one of the very best ways to connect with your child and to teach them new words. And actually, you don't even have to read all the words in a story. The main thing that you're going to want to do here is point to pictures and label what the picture is. And so again, if there's a picture of a dog, you're going to point and you're going to say something like, dog, see that dog? I see the dog. What's the dog say? That dog says woof, 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 dog. And so what are some things that, as a therapist, you know this, what are some strategies that I use throughout that? You know, we kept it really, really simple. I used the keyword, which was what? It was dog. We put the keywords where? We use them as single words, but we also use them at the ends of our phrases there for emphasis. And we uh, did some exclamatory words there too with our little uh, dog sound, right? And so those are the kinds of things that we say with a parent. And we say, even though you're using the book, you know, here's what's gonna help your child learn what these words mean. And so that's how we talk about it. And I like to talk about using books with parents too, because you know, it's so research-based and, and it's so easy for parents to do. They can read any time of day, but just like songs and just like social games, if you can link that with an everyday routine with a parent or help a, help a parent link that mentally, like, oh, every time before she goes to down for nap, we're going to read two or three books. You know, this is my language time that I'm, I'm putting into this reading activity. And so again, building that consistency is what will help a parent remember to read every day. So that's certainly uh, something that we want to facilitate with the parents that we're working with. Now our last big overall activity here finally is to playing with toys. And remember in stage one what we've said 50 times now that children are using all their senses to explore toys. And so good toys for this developmental stage include what? Toys that are easy to manipulate because we have children again at the very beginning of learning how to manipulate toys and use their hands and, and feed and everything else purposefully. And so babies and toddlers, it, who are in this stage with this exploratory play are going to be drawn to toys with lights and music. And again, we talk about that a lot, especially for our little guys who do have some uh, sensory issues. And I don't mean sensory issues as far as things being uncomfortable or they're a sensory seeker versus a sensory avoider. I mean real sensory issues like hearing loss or like some difficulty seeing. And so with kids like that, we do think about 
toys that will help them develop and refine those skills again that uh, you know really learn to listen but at the same time we have to be sure that we're including toys that don't have the bells and whistles to help a child really learn how to focus his attention and again our primary things here are how to hold how to look at and manipulate a variety of toys with his or her hand so that they are developmentally ready to move on to the next stage of play with toys and that next stage of play stage two is actually called non-functional play but when we get there kids are beyond the holding you know and here again our primary skills are what they're gonna hold a toy look at the toy mouth the toy listen to the toy you know that's all we want in stage one here that children again that we see that they are using their senses to really uh, process and learn new information so but even at this early stage we should show a child how to play with a toy and then if necessary help him learn what to do by gently using our own hands uh, to guide him to play now we have talked about this a lot in previous shows and we certainly talked about it back in the introductory show 465 for this series and we reviewed two pieces of really common sense obvious information but guess what they're research based <laughs> so they're evidence based so Research tells us that the best thing that we can do to help a child learn how to play with a toy is what? It's for an adult to show him how to play. <laughs> so adult modeling. So here, even at this stage where kids aren't doing a lot with toys yet, we still should be helping them and showing them what to do, which means that we are we are down there looking at the toy with them. We're, we're putting the toy in their hands. We're directing their visual attention to it. And again, we're giving them something to listen to as we talk about the toy. So adult modeling was important. And the second part of that is cueing. And remember what we said? were the, uh, the, the evidence-based strategies that we learned from research that tell us the best cues to use to help a child play with toys. It's going to be moving from the least amount of assistance to the most amount of assistance, meaning, and we said, remember that we're going to take that tagline that we talk about on nearly every show and how to teach any toddler anything. We're going to tell him, we're going to show him, and then we're going to help him. So tell him, those are our, our verbal cues. So we're talking about what he's hearing. That's the least amount. We're not touching him. We're not showing him anything. He's just listening and then making that connection. Then when we bump it up a little bit with cueing, it's the showing. So this is where, again, we're pointing. We're picking up a toy and putting it within our child's line of vision. That's the showing part, those visual cues. And lastly, helping. So that's the physical, hands-on, tactile assistance that we uh, might provide. And remember, sometimes we call that hand over hand. And last time we talked about hand under hand. It's sometimes really more effective for some children especially for children who have some tactile sensitivities and so you see some defensiveness you touch their little hand and they withdraw or if it's more behavioral they're swatting you away like hey get out of my way you know you're not going to be the boss of me right now or control or whatever you know and again i'm really exaggerating how that really looks but at the same time you know we we need to be sure that we are thinking about adult modeling and that we are providing the best cues that we can to help a child uh, learn how to play with toys and again learn language so those were our four big activities we talked about what we talked about singing playing social games, reading, and playing with toys. So that, that's the therapy plan for you, for any child who's in stage one and you're thinking, what am I gonna do with this kid? He's two, there are significant developmental issues. He's not, he, you know, we're, we're nowhere near talking. What are the things that we can do? And again, if you think about these four big components, that will really, really help you so that you are helping parents plan what they can do to be more effective uh, to develop play skills and language skills. And so I'm going to make sure that you hear me next, say this next sentence, and this is the key for stage one. You want to remember that the only way that babies learn what words mean and then eventually to talk is by hearing you say the same key words over and over. And as you play and as we talk about the recommended toys through the rest of this course today, our big goal here for stage one is just to pick one or two keywords per toy, and then we're gonna repeat those keywords many times as a child pays attention to that toy. Remember what we said about stage one, we're always gonna keep our language focused on what the child is paying attention to and looking at and listening to right in that moment. And so, uh, 
I talk all the time about repetition, but I'll tell you this summer, I am working on a new therapy manual called the Late Talker Workbook and in just really looking at the research and everything that, that we've learned from the most current studies, say the past 10 years, the best way to teach late talkers how to talk and it is high frequency repetition. So they have to hear the keyword or the target word. Research says nine times per minute. Now, if you were math challenged, you may not realize how often that is, but if you'll think about nine times per minute, I mean, my goodness, that's that you say a word, what? Every uh, five or six seconds, six or seven seconds, you're, saying, you're repeating what that keyword is. And so parents aren't gonna track that like we do as professionals, and that's okay. The point is you wanna help a parent know how repetitive that they have to be before a child is really going to be able to uh, link meaning with that word and you know and again they are not going to be able to say that word until they understand it first and so we have to really talk about high frequency repetition now we'll talk more about this as I finally get to model some of those toys uh, sitting over there and I know that's the most important part of the show to lots of uh, lots of you and that's why you're even watching as a parent and all the toys that I'm about to show you now uh, remember I want to talk about it's not just the toy it's what you do with the toy as the adult that's going to be really really important so keep that in mind and keep in mind too the high frequency repetition piece and choosing our keywords and it, you know again it's not just about these toys but they're going to be pretty good too and you can find links for each of these toys here below if you're watching on YouTube so now let's go ahead and move to that section of the course so let's talk about the recommended toys for stage one and remember what I said now because these are basic skills and basic toys you may be a tiny bit underwhelmed as we walk through this toy list and remember we said too that we're going to avoid toys with bells and whistles because they can actually limit a child's ability to learn language and why would that be that would be because kids get stuck they get stuck pushing the button or flipping the whatever and don't really move beyond that and so we want to really be able to hear at the earliest stages of play provide opportunities for children to learn how to hold a toy, look at a toy, develop their little attention spans without all those other things that can really interfere with that. Another thing that research says about using a lot of electronic toys is that parents go silent. When the toy talks, parents don't talk. And we know that that's detrimental uh, for a child who has a language delay. And so kids always learn how to talk best, not from a screen and not from a toy, but from a real life adult who's sitting there with them right in that moment talking about what a child is looking at and listening to. So here's our very, very first toy. Uh, it's a fabric ball. And so I want to get my notes so that I can point out a couple of really cool things about this toy. This toy is a wonderful choice for tummy time because it's not so frustrating for a child that they're not going to be able to do some things with it. When they touch it, when they try to grasp it and hold it, it's going to move just a little further away, which would get, again would be an incentive for a child to move. Super easy for a child to manipulate um, as they learn how to hold and grasp and explore this toy with various textures. And let's go ahead and talk about our language strategies here. So what's your keyword going to be? What's your keyword going to be with this toy? It's what? Of course, it's ball. And so we want to be sure that we are saying the word ball many, many times as a single word. And if we're going to talk in phrases and sentences, where are we going to put the keyword? What do we say about that? We're going to put it at the end of that phrase or sentence so that a child gets emphasized and so that it becomes salient to that child. So let's talk about just how, again, what are some things we would say? And I want to model it for you because I think this high frequency repetition is something that until parents really hear it, they don't really know how repetitive we have to be. So for here, you would say something like, ooh, here's the ball. Look, look, as we're pointing. Here's this ball. See, see the ball. Oh, feel it. Oh, this one's rough. Oh, feel that ball. See the ball. And again, the key point here is that you're going to repeat your target word over and over and over as many times as you can you're not ever really going to be too repetitive don't worry about that uh, and again this is a great first toy first choice for this stage 
The next toy I love for this phase is a spinning drum. And again, this is probably my favorite toy that I'm going to show you. It's so easy to spin and activate, and it is just mesmerizing for children as they learn, even with the slightest touch that they can make it move. And this particular one, there's a mirror, which again can be reflective. I don't think it's, I don't think the quality is that great with it, but certainly it's going to reflect a lot. And at this stage, you know, this is a pretty kind of advanced thing for a child to do here at stage one. It, we're kind of getting into cause and effect, which really is a stage two skill that we're teaching. But super, super toy here with stage one. I love all of these Montessori toys because they're so simple. They're so classic. And as a therapist, again, you may have even gotten caught up in the bells and whistle kind of cycle with choosing toys, particularly for children here at this age range, because frankly, sometimes we don't know what to do with those kids right but this is a super super toy uh, as a parent if you don't have this kind of toy if your child is in this stage I know that this is something that you're uh, gonna want to look at because it's just so so effective for teaching a child to learn how to stick with the toy uh, to develop that longer attention span and again it's it's more challenging than a rattle or something else that a child would hold but it doesn't take very much to activate now as a therapist you're probably thinking okay what can my kid word here be. And remember we said that predominantly the vocabularies of new talkers are what? They consist mostly of nouns. But here I want to challenge you a little bit and say that even choosing a really simple action word might be a better uh, choice for this rather than spinning drum or you get my point with that. Whatever the toy is, it may not make sense to really use nouns. So here using a verb as your action word. So something like what? like go you know you could even start the beginnings of verbal routines which we'll talk you know we talked about with our social games that's really what social games are children learn that you say the same words at the same time this with the same hand motions and so you could certainly even start something like ready set go as a child spins this but even an exclamatory word like Wee! or you know whoa but anything that you can pair while the child activates the toy uh, would be a really good choice for your keywords there. So this is a super little toy. Uh, and it's a great addition to your toy uh, vocabulary or, or toy uh, inventory uh, if you uh, don't have that already. This next toy is a tissue box, and I just love this too because the papers that come, the tissues are crinkly and perfect for teaching babies to listen as they play, and it's the very beginning of cause and effect as they learn. Hey, that's what happens with this toy every time I touch it. I hear that really, really cool noise. The other thing that the papers provide are really important tactile support, and this particular version, and I think I have, I, I'm not even sure if this version is still available, but I've linked several versions of tissue boxes if you look uh, in the recommended toys post, and this one comes with a, a scarf, so a scarf-like texture, so you've got not only the crinkle papers, but, you know, another option, and I think that's important as children uh, learn contrast. You know, this crinkly paper, this, this one does not make the same noise, and it doesn't feel the same as this one, and certainly this toy has tons of bright uh, colored pictures, so we talked about the visual senses that a child is learning to do that, too. So, uh, let's talk about keywords for this toy. And remember what we said about sometimes nouns don't make as much sense to use. You, know, you could teach tissue or paper if you want to, but my keyword when I play with this toy is probably pull. You know, as a child, uh, as you see them reaching for the toy and as they grab it, again, I think that would be a great keyword. As you exaggeratedly say pull, pull, pull that paper as they're trying to get it uh, out of the box. Another keyword here might be listen, uh, listen, and certainly as you're pointing uh, to your ear there and you're really helping children uh, stop and pause and, and really understand that they are causing that noise to happen. And remember what we said, it's the beginnings of cause and effect. Those cognitive concepts really aren't realistic or don't don't aren't really mastered until they get to stage two but we are forming the foundation here in stage one and so this is a nice early toy to start thinking about cause and effect and so if you like this one there are lots of versions um, below too uh, that you could pick but it's a super addition to your toy inventory 
I love this next little toy. It's a wobbler. It's smaller than the ones that I've purchased in the past, but I love it for kids who are here in this stage one play. And remember, it's a classic toy. The skill set you're working on, if you're not, if you're a developmental therapist, if you're not an SLP and you're thinking about those fine motor things and how to document this, eye hand coordination and muscle strength through the skills that you're really uh, focusing on here and babies can touch it and you know no matter where they touch it it's going to wobble and so it's going to create an interesting visual effect it's just the right size for little hands i mentioned that it's smaller than the ones but those are probably heavier this would be a nice one for as children move on to stage two and as they become more mobile i can certainly see that this would be a toy that children would want to pick up and uh, walk around with as they like to do so babies like we said before in the, this earliest stage of language development like listening to words but they really like listening to high interest words and so exclamatory words or any other little sound effects that you can use when you play are also really important key words uh, and as we look at this uh, as we're thinking of a noun you know teaching penguin or teaching wobbler toy at this stage of development is probably not our best target and so something like an exclamatory word like whoa you know as a child would push it or or you know any other little sound effect word uh, that you would think uh, could think of you know if it if it really knocks over you know even something like uh oh you know would be a good word to help a child really listen to you as you are pouring language on what they are looking at and paying attention to and remember what we talked about with visual cues and we said that the visual cues would tell him show him help him that that's the second part of our cueing with a child and so really uh, teaching a parent to uh, use their visual cues and really tap or really you know again the tactile cues with helping put their child's hand on the toy to teach a child that they can uh, operate the toy and so remember we said that anytime that we have a toy that we are paying attention to and that the child is paying attention to we, we call that working on joint attention and that's so important for learning language because we want a child again able to shift his attention between you as the adult who's talking to him who's giving him that language input and certainly with what he's paying attention to and then what what he's doing during that playtime so this is a great toy to think about working on joint attention and when I work on joint attention with children one of the things that I think about doing is making my face <laughs> easier for a child to be able to include in his play routine so sometimes we have to do that positionally and certainly with a toy like this what would you do you're gonna be down on the ground right you're gonna be right down there and putting your face right beside the toy so that it's not so hard for the child who's playing on the floor to, to look at his little hands and look at what he's doing with the toy and then look way up at you and then look back down. That's way too much effort for some of our little guys with developmental delays and disorders. And so we want to help them with that. So that's a, that's a good tip for you as a therapist to think about, you know, that environmental manipulation. The big piece here would be manipulating you to get you in the right place for that and your face right there so that we can start to work on joint attention. And this is a great Great, great toy to do it with. I love this earliest little shape sorter for kids who are in stage one. Other shape sorters come later as we talk about stage two and on into stage three as children really start constructive play. But right here, this one's fantastic because all the child has to do is put the shape in, manipulate it, move it in whatever way that they can, and then it will fit through the strings that are on the side. So super, super toy. The cognitive skill, you know, we've been talking about uh, cause and effect as we looked at the little penguin toy. We haven't really talked too much about object permanence. We probably should have done that with the tissue box toy. But here with our shape sorter, it's early problem solving. So how do I get this block into uh, this, this uh, bigger box here? How can I get that in there? And that's what kids are learning. How can I reach my fingers in and take some of these shapes out? And so this is a super, super toy for facilitating early problem solving. And again, remember, we're not gonna see that in its fullest a uh, uh, really really developed phase until stage two but we're going to start it here at stage one now if you're thinking about keywords for this toy we haven't talked about this in this course but let's talk about the non-importance <laughs> of shapes colors letters and numbers and so naturally a parent would look at this and want to say yellow star blue circle 
a purple block or whatever they want to say purple square and so academic words like that are really not important until the child has established a really basic vocabulary so for here you might pick some exclamatory words or uh, even some early prepositions and again kids aren't going to understand what the word in means for a long long time but you're still going to teach it through repetition and again start the earliest foundations of that you know it's a, putting things in and taking things out are a primary activity that toddlers do throughout toddlerhood and so this is an early toy to kind of start that and start those concepts so what i say when i play with this toy usually is i i just focus on words like in and like push and then my exclamatory words like ooh or oh my goodness you know anything that you would say like that again to direct attention to that and remember what we said about how children learn how to play what's the best evidence-based strategy remember what we said it's adult modeling so what does that mean that means you're going to show a child how to pick up the object especially if they're sitting and they're they're able to even even if they're not super um their balance isn't that great yet if you have them in front of you and this is how i would play with this toy too sometimes i play face to face but for a child if i wanted him really stable while he's sitting and he he wasn't uh, really sitting up on his own uh with lots and lots of balance yet i would just put him between my legs and then put the toy you know have him face the toy and me face the toy and then just put the toy there so that i can do a lot of hand over hand with him and i can show him adult modeling as i'm pushing the square in or pulling the toy out you know and i can even take his little hands and help him manipulate the toy too so super super toy you're covering lots of ground with this as you work on the cognitive components the physical fine motor access aspects of this as well as your uh, target words with the language strategies that you're using the next toy is this really cool rain stick rattle i don't know if you can really hear it but the beads are they're not irritating or like some of our electronic toys, right? This is just a really gentle sound that really teaches kids how to listen. And again, they we've got the uh, the beads as they fall over the, the uh, turning pieces of this. Super, super interesting for babies to look at. Uh, they can, with this toy, learn how to hold it, shake it, roll it around. It's another great toy for encouraging mobility. So why is mobility important in stage one? You know, just forget the physical part of that you know they're working toward walking we want we want them all to do that besides that mobility really drives sensory exploration and remember that's that's what the whole focus of this stage is for kids as they're learning how to play you want them using all their senses to really take in everything that's going on around them with their environment but the big thing about mobility is is many times we don't see natural curiosity and again that drive to explore really happens with kids until they become mobile and so some of our kids particularly our little friends who are older toddlers or preschoolers who are still back in this first stage of play uh, we want to do things that really encourage again that mobility so that they can learn you know I've got to move and when I move I see different things and when I see different things I learn I learn about those objects too my mom begins to talk to me about different things because I'm able to get out of this little space of my blanket I'm able to cross all over by the couch and I'm able to move over by the door and so they're just new experiences for me to take into my little body and process as well as the new words that I'm going to hear my mom say as I am uh, thinking uh, as a child you know begins to pay attention to new things so anytime we're doing that and oh, let me say this let me just characterize it and just say it all in one sentence so you get it mobility drives sensory exploration it also drives cognitive development and that's you know how a child learns how he thinks how he plans how he remembers and cognitive development really is the foundation for language development and so again when we have a toy and when we're thinking about even these simplest toys like this you know why is this toy important what is it doing and as therapists we should be able to explain these kinds of things to parents so again they're not just thinking all she does is play when's she ever going to teach him how to talk i don't even understand how this relates to learning words and so when you really lay it out for a parent like that and you talk about you know 
know, we've got to get him mobile because that, that makes him able to explore more. And the more he explores, the more he's going to learn. And that's his cognitive development. And because of that cognitive development piece, you know, that's the foundation for learning what words mean. And once he learns what words mean, then he's ready to use those words to learn how to talk. And so when you can package all of that information in a script that uses a as a professional use over and over and over, you're going to be more effective too because, again, your parents are hearing that information and they're understanding more of why you're doing what you're doing as you play. All right, so let's talk about keywords for here. Again, it's so funny that I started out talking about nouns and how important nouns are. And we only use noun, a noun keyword with that first toy with that fabric ball. But I want you to understand, again, how all of this plays together and how, and how again, when we talk about uh, language development, the kinds of things that we should be talking to parents about and telling them about. And so with a toy like this, you know, I don't think calling it a rain stick rattle is probably our very best keyword. So something like, wow, look, oh, listen, listen, those kinds of words. So exclamatory words, those early verbs. I love using listen as a keyword uh, here for stage one. And certainly, you know, rolling, rolling the rain stick across the floor. Even saying something like go, again, like we did for the spinning drum, would be a super target word for this. But I like this toy, again, for the reasons that we talked about, because it encourages cognitive exploration, sensory exploration and cognitive development. So remember that as you're talking about that with parents. The next toy is this cool mirror puzzle. I hope that you can see the mirror. See that that's what's inside the uh, puzzle there. Babies love this toy because it's, and even older toddlers, because they don't expect that a mirror is going to be there. So it's such a good surprise. And looking in a mirror, like we said before, is just one of the basic uh, play routines that we want to do with all children who are in this stage of development. Even if it's in that chronological period, birth to eight months, and certainly if they're older toddlers and still in this developmental phase, uh, this is a great toy for that. Any kind of mirror toy is going to be a good choice for stage one. And there's a great mirror toy that's on the recommended toy list. It's, uh, it's a spinning mirror or a mirror that's on wheels. And I love that because kids who are beginning to be mobile, like we talked about, can push it. And it's such a motivator to uh, get them to try to scoot and roll and move on their own. So what do we do for this toy? You know, you're helping a child learn learn how to pick up uh, the knob and move it over. Kids who are in, in stage one are not going to be very efficient with that. It's going to take them a long time. It's going to be a lot of trial and error, which again, that's predominantly how kids learn how to play with toys, especially in stage two. And we're going to talk about that a lot, but we're, we're forming the foundation for that here in stage one. So, you know, something, an exclamatory word here like, ooh, look, who is it? Who is it? It's, you know, when you say the child's name is there looking in the mirror. So that's a really cute little play routine. I do this a lot with uh, peekaboo, you know, and holding it in front of the child, you know, where's Millie? Where's Millie? Boo! You know, and she sees herself hopefully in the mirror. So another little cute play routine for you to do with a mirror puzzle, but it's a great one. If you're a therapist and you don't have this tool, it's a super, super toy for you to add to your toy inventory. The last activity or toy that I want to talk to you about here today for stage one is container play. Now, container play is so important because it really pulls together all the kind of things that we talked about, and we're really giving a child lots of opportunities to explore as we put together our little kit for container play. So, obviously, you can use any kind of container I like. Plastic uh, containers with lids because I think it's easier as a therapist or as a parent to be able to contain this. Now, container play as a therapist, you're probably not doing a lot of this when children come into your office, but we certainly should be helping parents with children in this stage come up with these kinds of ideas. And if you are a therapist who does home visits, this is the kind of activity that you don't need any supplies for. You can just go in and help a parent uh, pick and choose things that they already have there in their homes. And again, and even families with limited resources, you're going to be able to come up with enough things to help a child really, really enjoy container play. And so we said that we would need a container for this. I like things with tops again because it just helps me stay organized. I really loved using uh, 
white boxes, diaper white boxes for this kind of thing, but they don't really make this anymore. When I went out a couple of weeks ago and I was really pulling together all the toys that I already have and then buying another couple of new things to kind of spice things up, I was shocked that they didn't really offer white boxes anymore. And I bought wipes. You know, we have grandchildren uh, who are babies, but I just didn't realize that they don't have this. So if you can find one of these, the reason I like it, and this would be for older babies who are at the end of this uh, developmental stage, uh, there's a little hole here. And it used to have a little flap so that you could push uh, the button here and the flap popped up and then just this uh, indentation here, the slot for kids to push the toys through. And so then you could use this toy as kids move on uh, to stage two. But I really like that option. If you can't find it though, any bucket, pan, bowl, anything like that will do. So what you're going to do is assemble toys that do different things. And remember what we said, we want for sensory exploration, we're always thinking about what can a kid see, what can a kid hear, what can a kid feel, and what can a kid mouth. And so look for safe toys and options. And for container play in the most traditional sense, you want a child or a baby who's in this phase just to be able to sit down, open this container and take the toys out one by one. Lots of times they're into dumping what's in the container and that's fine too. Because remember what we said, dumping and filling will be a predominant activity throughout toddlerhood. But look for things to put in uh, the bowl that have, like I said before, different sensory properties. So this ball has a bell in the middle so kids can hear that as they shake it and roll it around. It's also got holes, so great tactile experiences for kids. Something like a car or a truck, something with wheels. Kids aren't going to be to the stage that they can push the toy yet. That's functional play, and we won't get there until you know we start a little bit of it in stage two with non-functional play as kids learn how to do more things with objects. But then by stage three, functional play where they're really beginning to use familiar toys appropriately. Again, we're laying the foundation. So we want them just recognizing that there are different properties of toys. So something like this vinyl book, kids can mouth it. There's a squeaker there. Uh, certainly uh, cool pictures to look at through there. And so when you are uh, looking for things to put in there, be sure that you're thinking about, you know, what can the kids see? What can the he kid hear? What can he feel? And also make sure that your toys are really safe. Like, and here's the point that I wanted to bring up. I just bought these new little busy balls, which are perfect for container play here at stage one. And then as we move on into the next couple of phases too, I love them because the child can do different things with them and uh, learn how to connect uh, the balls himself but you probably see the problem. I would not put this toy in a, uh, for container play with a child that I was not gonna sit with and supervise 100% of the time with my full attention because you know that the child is gonna mouth the toy and I'm afraid these little ears might come off. So cute on the caterpillar, but we certainly don't want a choking hazard there. But as you are assembling your containers, uh, you could even take some of the toys that we already use, the little rain rattle would be good in here the penguin would be good and so put all of these things together and again it gives you a nice way to organize this and the child again many many opportunities for play and so if you are a therapist and going into home visits and you don't even take your own materials anymore like we said before you can assemble this uh, with a family or go ahead and put it together ahead of time and take it in and say, hey, I just want to show you this and I want to talk about the different toys that I've put together in this. And again, be, think about it, you know, think, try to get something that moves, try to get something that the child can hear, try to get uh, things like blocks that the child can hold in his hand. And again, this is not really a stage one behavior here. Remember we said kids are going to look at it and grasp it and mouth it. Banging is going to come next in non-functional play, but remember we're going to always set the stage for that. So even having a child, you know, hold a block in each hand here at stage one would be helping him get developmentally ready to move on to stage two. So what do you do when you're playing with this? If you're the therapist and you're going to see a kid tomorrow that you think this would be perfect for, and you think, that's great, but what am I going to say? I'm kind of limited. 
Think about the keyword scripts that we've walked through with some of these toys. And again, remember, you're modeling this for a parent. So just as the child, you know, you, you might say something to get started like, you know, wow, what's in here? Oh, we're going to look at some things. You ready? You ready? Let's open. Let's open. And again, you're starting these verbal routines and you're teaching a kid how to play, even if he's not understanding those words yet. You're setting the stage for him to be able to understand over time, you know, what you mean. And so, again, you open it, and then you just have the child, you know, he's going to reach in and take out a toy, and you just talk about it. And so, when he gets the penguin out, what are you going to do? You're going to go into the script that we already talked about, where he's got the, the penguins on the floor, and every time that he pushes it, you're going to say, whoa, look at that, ooh, He's, he's dancing or whatever word you want to use that. He's wobbling. He's moving. You know, and again, use your, use your keywords there. Use your scripts and talk to parents just like I've talked to you about today with this course that, key, uh, you know, we have to pick a keyword, one or two keywords per toy. And we're going to say it the same way. Uh, the same word every time the child plays with this toy because our our overall goal here is to help a child learn what the words mean and to develop meaning so we're working on his receptive language and that's exactly what you do so how i've talked through this whole show and giving you this information that's what you say to parents this is how you train parents as you're playing in stage one so again give the child the item watch for his response use your keywords show him how to play if the child isn't doing anything even and remember it's not we don't have a high bar here <laughs> we want them to look at and grasp and hold and mouth the toy you know listen to the toy the sounds that they make and so think about what your keywords would be and then walk a parent through that so container play is a great way to pull all of these things together all of the all of the skills that we've talked about for play skills and for language skills and really really help a parent learn how to use the strategies that we've talked about through the whole course so for our final topic today, let's talk about moving on to stage two. So when is a child ready to move from stage one toys to stage two toys? And that would be when he really starts doing very simple actions with objects. And again, we're not going to make the bar so high here. So in, I try to think about it any time that I see a child holding objects and looking at objects and trying to do something or manipulate the object beyond mouthing. And so when you see mouthing, mouthing still developmentally appropriate until the child is 24 months developmentally. But when you see that mouthing start to subside and you see, oh, she's holding those toys better. Oh my goodness, she has a toy in this hand and she's reaching for a toy with that hand. You know, they're having some, uh, using their hands separately, they're able to do that. Those kinds of things are when you look for moving on to stage two. And remember what we said stage two is, if you watch the introductory show, it's non-functional play. So this is when a child learns how to do that next little rung of skills, which would be things like banging or patting or pushing or stacking anything that's beyond holding mouthing or something like dropping but i even think dropping is a little bit higher skill than stage one but again we're going to look for those and we're going to look for those readiness signals that we say oh i think she's ready to bump on up because she's paid more attention here today she's 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 trying to do more things with the toy so that i know that we're ready to bump up and i'll tell you from my own experience container play has usually been where we notice an increase in the play skills that move kids towards towards stage two so as i said before if you don't have container play going with a kid who's in stage one get that going today because that, uh, you're going to put all of those opportunities right there kind of in one one episode of play and so that will help a kid be ready to move on to stage two and so that's what we're going to do in every show here in this uh, podcast series is talk about what the stage is and then show you the toys, talk about the language strategies, talk about the play skills, and then talk about how to know that a child is ready to move on to the next phase. All right, I have all the toys plus some additional toys recommended for this stage in a post that I've called Stage One Toys. And so that's going to be right here, uh, the link below here on YouTube. You can also find it on my website at Teach Me to Talk for course number 466. You would just search Stage One Toys. I also want to let you know that I have a new Therapy Tip of the Week series coming up that we're offering with this podcast series uh, super soon. As soon as 
as I get the uh, that video recorded, I will link it here on this course so that you can see the toys too. And we're going to talk about some different ways to organize the toys and present the toys. And it's sort of the parent version of uh, what this longer course has been. Now, if you want to find out more ideas about working with children in this stage of play and language development, I want to remind you of the two therapy manuals that I mentioned before. Let's talk about talking and teach me to play with you. And I'll have those links below too. That's been a lot of information and that is all for today. Thank you for sticking with me through this entire course we so appreciate it if you need your CE credit be sure to get that at my website at teach me to talk course 466 and if you're watching on YouTube the link is right here below all right that's it for today I'm Laura Mize pediatric speech language pathologist and thank you so much for watching this course from teach me to talk mm -hmm.